Hello, I'm Kate Campiti, Associate Publisher and Sales Manager of Business West and the Healthcare News. Welcome to our 2020 Healthcare Heroes, and thank you for joining us. I also want to say thank you for sticking with us. There have been so many changes over the last year for everyone, and we, as everyone else in business, have had to learn how to pivot. So we started off planning our Healthcare Heroes event as an in-person event. Then we were thinking, okay, well, things have changed and we could go to a hybrid event. Some people in person with our honorees and others joining us virtually. And as you know, that changed as well. So here we are, fully virtual, and we appreciate that you have stuck with us and that you're here with us to join us today. Thank you. We started this program three years ago to recognize people, groups, and institutions in healthcare, which is a large and very important sector of our economy. And throughout 2020, our healthcare community has proven time and time again how much they do for us. Across our region, people within healthcare have stepped up in response to the pandemic. And if you were to ask them about their work, they would say they're just doing their jobs. Maybe, but they go well beyond what's in their job descriptions. They've stepped up, assumed risks, and in many cases, they put their own health and lives at stake. It's this level of care and dedication to others that make them true healthcare heroes. We have a lot of people and work to celebrate, but before we do, I'd like to recognize those making it possible for us to honor these heroes, our sponsors. Thank you to our presenting sponsors, Elms College, Bay State Health, and Health New England for your trust and confidence in partnering with us on this program. I'd also like to thank our supporting sponsors, Bulkley Richardson and Mercy Medical Center and Trinity Health. Bulkley Richardson has provided high quality legal services to clients for nearly a century and was ranked as 2021 best law firm in 11 practice areas by best lawyers in partnership with US News and World Reports. And Trinity Health is one of the largest Catholic healthcare systems in the nation with 92 hospitals, including Mercy Medical Center an acute care hospital in Springfield. And thank you to Comcast Business for supporting our many events throughout the years. Thank you to all of our sponsors for your support and allowing us to bring recognition to our healthcare heroes. At this time, we'll be hearing from our presenting sponsors. First, a message from Elms College. Elms College is a co-educational Catholic liberal arts institution. What's unique about Elms is that our values of community, justice, faith, and excellence are at the core of all our academic programs, especially nursing. Our vision is to graduate nurses and others working in the business of health care who are prepared to respond to the needs of a diverse society with the compassion, knowledge, and skills necessary to continuously improve the quality and safety of today's healthcare system. For four decades, our Bachelors of Science in Nursing program has provided a significant pipeline of prepared nurses into our community. Our experienced faculty and simulation lab provide exceptional learning opportunities for students. Academic studies are supported by community outreach and service learning. We consider our clinical learning environment to be exceptional providing students with the valuable experience of working with patients, practicing nurses, and hospital leaders throughout our regional healthcare organizations. The Master of Science in Nursing is a completely online program with tracks to pursue careers as nurse educators, nursing and health service managers, and school nurses. Courses can be completed at a student's own pace, making it easier to balance personal and professional lives with academics. The Doctor of Nursing Practice offers three unique concentrations, the advanced practice roles of family nurse practitioner and adult acute gerontology nurse practitioner, prepare nurses to care for patients and families across the care continuum. For accomplished nurses seeking to advance their careers in leadership, the DMP Health Systems Innovation and Leadership Concentration uniquely equips them with the knowledge and skills to lead complex and ever-changing healthcare organizations and systems. 
The need for leaders in healthcare with a strong business acumen is at the core of our MBA and healthcare leadership. It prepares current and aspiring leaders by integrating foundational business knowledge with an understanding of how to navigate the complex healthcare landscape. Connecting local health with global culture is our certificate in global health. Students gain an adaptable interdisciplinary skill set that can be applied to clinical nursing, healthcare administration, social work, community activism, and mental health. We're very proud of the thousands of Elms College alumni serving in this region as clinicians, leaders, and innovators in all areas of healthcare. We sincerely congratulate all of this year's honorees. Thank you, Elms College. And now please welcome Director of MBA Graduate Business Programs, Kim Kenny Rockwell. Good evening and welcome to the fourth annual Healthcare Heroes Awards. I'm Kim Kenny Rockwell, Director of the MBA and Graduate Business Programs at Elms College. For 92 years, Elms College has been an essential part of the educational landscape of Western Massachusetts and we're proud to be this year's academic presenting sponsor. We commend all of the awardees and celebrate them for investing in careers of passion and purpose in healthcare. Although we can't all be in person to celebrate you, we send you our heartfelt best wishes. A special congratulations to Maggie Aboso, an MBA MSN Elms graduate, and Chris Savino, an Elms College student in healthcare management. We're so proud of you both. Congratulations to all of the 2020 Healthcare Hero Award winners. Enjoy your evening. Thank you, Kim and Elms College. And now, a message from our presenting sponsor, Bay State Health. How I see my patients may be different. The care is not. I know how critical my role is in our safety. We're fighting back with goodness and we will win. For nearly 150 years, our community has entrusted Bay State Health with their well being. It's our privilege to care for you and your family. Thank you. I'm Dr. Mark Kerouac, President and CEO of Bay State Health. Join me in giving a heartfelt thank you to our frontline healthcare heroes and all who support them. Together, these 12,000 courageous and compassionate individuals are helping each other to help our community. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Bay State Health is proud to support Business West and Healthcare News. Congratulations to this year's honorees. Thank you, Bay State Health and Dr. Mark Kerouac. And now a message from our presenting sponsor, Health New England. All across the nation, frontline medical workers have answered to the call of duty in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. These are our real superheroes. They are individuals who are courageous and resilient, overcome adversity, become the voices for those who've gone unheard, continue to push for change and advancement, are selfless in their service to others. These heroes have consoled us when we are scared and provided us comfort when we are hurt. They have cured us when we are sick and have given us hope when we felt helpless. They go above and beyond the call of duty to make a difference in our health and lives. Health New England is proud to support the 2020 Healthcare Heroes nominees. We honor your passion, ingenuity, and commitment that makes a difference in healthcare and in the health and lives of people in our community. Thank you to Health New England. And now a message from the President and CEO of Bay State Health, Dr. Mark Kerouac. Good evening. I'm Mark Kerouac, President and CEO of Bay State Health. Thanks for joining us for this fourth annual Healthcare Heroes event. And congratulations to my fellow honorees. Bay State Health and Health New England are proud to support this recognition of all the wonderful work 
in health care that goes on every day in our communities. Heroes are people we admire for their achievements or qualities. I had the opportunity to meet many real heroes during the COVID-19 pandemic. They were the bedside caregivers who focused more on the care of their patients than the unknown risk to themselves that they were assuming. They were the people who gave their all to support them with personal protective equipment, testing, making sense of rapidly shifting guidance, and just overall emotional support. They were the people whose regular jobs were suspended and who raised their hands to say, I'll do anything I can to help. They were the leaders of outreach efforts by both Bay State Health and Health New England who helped those we serve with the testing, supplies, and the knowledge to stay safe. And they were all the people in those same communities who kept the community together in spite of distance and barriers. They helped care for children, the elderly, and those in need. All of these people showed great determination, ingenuity, and togetherness that made it possible for us to minimize the impact of this terrible disease on our community. Thank you for your courage and your kindness, and congratulations to you for being healthcare heroes. Thank you, Dr. Mark Harawak, Bay State Health, and Health New England. And again, a big thank you to all our sponsors, Elms College, Bay State Health, Health New England, Bulkley Richardson, and Mercy Medical Center. I'd also like to thank our vendors who helped make this virtual event possible. Thank you to Madoff Media, CJC Creative, DNA Fine Photography, Go Graphics, Diff Design, and Artcraft. We appreciate our sponsors and vendors and we appreciate all of you joining us today. Enjoy the rest of our program and recognition of our healthcare heroes. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to this salute to our healthcare heroes for 2020. I'm George O'Brien, editor and associate publisher of Business West and the Healthcare News. It is traditional on occasions like this for someone like me to talk about how honored and privileged they are to be here to introduce our honorees. But that's exactly how I feel, honored and privileged. As you can easily tell by the color of my hair, I've been doing this a long time, more than 40 years to be exact, 25 of them as editor of Business West and 20 as the editor of Healthcare News. In all that time, I'm quite sure that I've never done anything as rewarding professionally as getting to interview and write about many of our honorees today. Each story is remarkable in its own way, and we're proud to be able to tell them and pay tribute to these individuals and groups. These stories made me proud to be from this area and very proud of the healthcare sector here and all those who work within it. We received more than 70 nominations for this award this past year, and every single nominee is a true hero. We're here today to honor those who stood out, even among all those great nominations. And speaking of nominations, I'd like to recall a conversation I had with one of our judges, Christina Hubner Torres, Director of Research and Wellness at the Caring Health Center in Springfield, and a winner of this award in the innovation category last year. Now, usually when a judge calls me, it's not good news. Uh, they're missing a page of a nomination, or they don't understand the judging guidelines, or they want to know why I didn't tell them that this would consume a whole week of their life, something like that. Not this time. Christina wanted to talk about what a genuinely fun, rewarding, and uplifting experience it was to read all these nominations. She told me that each one inspired her, and many, quote, brought her straight to tears, as she put it. I hadn't read them at that point, but when I did, I had to agree with her. These are great stories. Before I get to them, though, I'd like to acknowledge our previous honorees, the healthcare heroes from 2017, 2018, and 2019. And now I'd like to introduce all our judges. You've already met Christina. Again, she's the Director of Research and Wellness at the Caring Health Center. Also judging this year were Dr. Harry DeMay, President of Elms College, one of our sponsors, 
and Karen Wilson, the now retired president and CEO of Behavioral Health Network and winner of this award last year in the Lifetime Achievement category. And now, it's on to the introduction of this year's honorees. As most of you know, Business West and the Healthcare News have a number of recognition programs, 40 Under 40, Women of Impact, Difference Makers, and all of them are, to one extent or another, nomination driven. And we always tell people, the better the nomination, the easier it will be to get your points across to the judges. Lisa Gaudette, the Vice President of Business Development and Marketing at Berkshire Healthcare Systems, certainly took this message to heart. She wrote a moving nomination of three people she works with at BHCS. Emmeline Bean, Lydia Bryson, and Christopher Savino. One that certainly conveyed the essence of why these three are being honored here tonight. The raw emotion in that nomination comes through, and for a reason. Lisa was the one who picked up the phone and asked all three of them to take a temporary leave from their behind-the-scenes jobs as clinical liaisons at BHCS, travel across the state, and work on the front lines of an emerging health care crisis at one of the agency's long-term care facilities. None of them really knew what they were getting into, but they all said yes, or of course, or words to that effect. And when I interviewed them, they said much more. They said things like, this is why I became a nurse, or this is why you take that oath, or we went to nursing school for a reason. All three of them will become frontline nurses at a BHCS facility in Danvers. They walked into a very dangerous situation. Residents at that facility were scared. Many of them were sick. Some of them would die. These three individuals took care of them, and they comforted family members as well. As they mentioned while talking with me, they ate a lot of bagels and pizza together. They supported one another in every way that they could, and they did some crying in the shower after one of their patients died. In many ways, these three individuals, Lydia, Emmeline, and Christopher, epitomizes what it means to be a healthcare hero in these difficult and very tragic times. They didn't think about what was in their job descriptions. They thought about what they could do to help. They weren't thinking about themselves. They were thinking about others and how they could help. They said yes when others were telling them it was perfectly okay for them to say, no, this isn't my job. As I said at the top, their responses to Lisa Gaudette's request for help made for some good nomination copy. More than that, they really drive home what it means to be a healthcare hero at any time, but especially in 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, here are Emmeline Bean, Lydia Bryson, and Christopher Savino. We just want to say thank you to um, everybody that supported us through um, the time on the front lines. Thank you to um, Business West and the judges for selecting us. Um, it means the world. Um, it was a rough time for everybody. Um, and also a big thank you to Lisa, our, um, our boss that nominated us, and all of the um, healthcare heroes that didn't get um, the actual award, the ones that we worked with on the front lines, um, kind of dedicated to them as well. We're humbled and honored. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Emmeline, Lydia, and Christopher. Congratulations again. When I set out to do interviews for the stories involving this year's healthcare heroes, I insisted on doing something I knew would be somewhat difficult. I wanted to meet these people in person. Now you can talk to somebody by phone and you can meet by Zoom, but boy, I've come to really hate Zoom by now. But these are people I wanted to meet, even if I knew I couldn't shake their hand or sit very close to them. And I'm glad I did, especially in the case of Rabbi Devorah Jacobson. We sat outside the Julian J. Levitt Family Jewish Nursing Home, which lost several residents to COVID-19 last spring. As I mentioned in my article, she pointed several times to the building as we talked and said, I'm honored that I'm being recognized, but the real heroes are in there. She was referring to the doctors, nurses, and other health professionals who are on the front lines of care. And she was right in what she was saying. 
but probably every one of those frontline providers would point right back at her and say the same thing. She is a real hero. And she's a hero for many reasons, but especially in the way that she became a source of comfort to many within the broad family at Jewish Geriatric Services. That includes patients, of course, and their loved ones, but especially the staff members who have endured so much. At the height of the crisis, Rabbi Jacobson went to work each day asking herself how she could carry out her broad role as director of spiritual life, how she could help and comfort all those who were being impacted by the pandemic. And she kept finding new ways, from securing donations of meals to those frontline workers, to putting on PPP and working alongside those care providers at the bedside. It's work that continues to this day. Indeed, months after the most difficult stretch at the height of the first wave of the virus, many staff members are still struggling to cope with what they've experienced and are suffering from a form of post-traumatic stress disorder. These wounds, if you will, are deep, but Rabbi Jacobson is helping them heal. She's doing this in many ways, by connecting them with mental health counselors, by creating prayer and inspiration cards, and often just by listening herself and being a source of hope and inspiration to all those around her. As I said earlier, during our interview, Rabbi Jacobson kept referring to those she considers to be the real heroes at JGS. In every way imaginable, she is a real hero herself. And that's made clear in this testimonial from Susan Halpern, Vice President of Development and Communications for JGS, who nominated Rabbi Jacobson. Our heroes are people we look up to and admire for their extraordinary actions and achievements. They are people we wish to emulate. Devore's countless acts of caring and loving kindness, her concern for others, her efforts seeking justice for all, make her a standout candidate for the prestigious Healthcare Heroes Award. I think that pretty much sums things up. Ladies and gentlemen, Rabbi Devorah Jacobson. Good evening. I want to firstly thank Business West and Healthcare News for this tremendous honor. George O'Brien, you are a talented writer and careful listener, and you wrote a really touching article. My friends tell me your words move them to tears. I want to also thank Susan Halpern, my friend and Vice President of Development and Communications at JGS Life Care, who responded quickly to this call for nominations and crafted a really beautiful description of my work during the COVID crisis. I want to also recognize the professional and lay leaders of JGS Life Care and Chelsea Jewish Life Care for the privilege they have given me of doing this work that I do with residents, families, and staff for the last 20 years. You have given me a unique opportunity to serve as the multi-faith chaplain and rabbi of this precious Jewish-sponsored institution, which is now over 108 years old. It is on behalf of the terrific team of healthcare professionals at JGS with whom I work, the nurses and CNAs, the housekeepers, dietary and activity staff, that I accept this award. Their spirit surrounds me tonight. If they were here in person, I would want to introduce them to you and to start by telling you that they are very spiritual people. In religious language, they are God's representatives here on earth. During the very difficult months of battling the COVID virus, they continued to work overtime and extra shifts, despite their exhaustion and fears and despite their direct exposure to the virus. They stayed focused and grounded in the commitments they made when they first became professional caregivers years ago. And they told me over and over again, I need to come in. The residents' families cannot. Who else will be there for them to hold their hand to care for them, to be there especially in, the la in their last hours. At times like these, I often turn to the wisdom of spiritual teachings, like this one from the ancient Jewish text called the Talmud. The rabbis are wrestling there with the question, as we journey through life, what does God most want from us? To which they conclude simply, Rachamana libabai, God wants the heart. For any of us who work with other human beings, especially in the complex arena of healthcare, it's a great lesson and a necessary reminder. At the end of the day, beyond all the academic training and professional skills that we need to develop, which are important, it is our love and kindness 
that will make all the difference. And so as we go about our work of healing, healing of body and healing of spirit, it is the gifts of our hearts that always matter most. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rabbi Jacobson, and congratulations again. As I mentioned with our previous honoree, I wanted to meet these people in person. And in a few cases, that, been, that meant them coming to us, which is a continuation of a trend that's been going on for years now. As more people work out of their homes, they come to us. So much so that we've had to get creative with photos because people have been recognizing that the same art on the walls was coming up all those pictures of various business owners. But that's another story. As I kept looking across our conference room table at Jennifer Graham, I was struck by the poise and the confidence exhibited by the Bay Path University student. And I kept thinking back to what I was like at that age. And with that, I can make a huge leap to John King, the CNN political analyst and his magic wall. He kept referring to the blue wall and how the Democrats had to rebuild it. Any of you who might have gone to UMass in the 70s like I did, you know what I'm talking about. The blue wall was the campus watering hole. That's where I spent most of my junior and senior years while I wasn't writing sports columns for the Collegian. And that's what I was doing when I was that age, wondering where the next beer was coming from. That's why I was so struck by Jennifer, who provides more evidence that there are many types of heroes emerging during this crisis. And notice how I use the present tense. We have a long way to go here. Jennifer took a job with O'Connell Care at Home in late 2019 and had just settled in when the pandemic hit. As we noted in our story on her, everything changed when she came back from a cruise last March. The pandemic had arrived and it closed down her college campus. It changed how she provided care in the home to her clients and in a big way. And it presented her with a unique opportunity to step up, make a difference, learn about herself, and develop even more confidence, if that's possible. Indeed, she volunteered to provide care to the homeless at an outdoor COVID-19 triage facility. When asked why she would sign up for such hazardous duty, she said simply, there was an obvious need and I just thought that I could help. I thought I could do my part. Her part was to step up and provide care and comfort to a population that was and still is in need and was and still is in obvious peril. Her compassion, professionalism and courage, yes, that's the appropriate word, are perhaps best send up in these comments from the gentleman who nominated Jennifer, Michael Hynek, a GR generalist at O'Connell Care at Home. She really stepped up to the plate when it came to transitioning away from the elderly care and into the homeless care and serving that vulnerable population. She took on a brand new challenge and I don't think a lot of people would step up to the plate in that situation. Jennifer did step up and in doing so, she's shown us something perhaps even more impressive. She turned this pandemic into a learning experience on all kinds of levels. Specifically, she, she's learned through this experience that professionally, she wants a job that will bring her closer to patients and give her even more one-on-one -on -one interaction with people. She did not want to be a doctor. Now she wants to be a nurse. She's come away from this pandemic even more committed to a fulfilling career in healthcare. That makes her my healthcare hero, and it should make her yours as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Jennifer Graham. I want to thank everyone for being here virtually this evening. Times are different this year, but we're making the most of it. I am so thankful to be recognized at this event and to be honored with all the other healthcare heroes in our community. This virus has been so unpredictable, changing everybody's daily routine. It's frightening, but as a CNA, to be by someone's side during this tragedy was such an impactful experience. My experience being on the front lines during this pandemic is the reason why I want to become a nurse. It was so rewarding. For several months, I was working side by side with doctors and nurses in a tent full of our homeless population. At the end of each shift, I had a different perspective on my career, changing my career path and what I want to pursue. 
I decided that from my experience that I didn't want to be this doctor I imagined anymore. I wanted more. I want to become a nurse. This tragedy has changed my career path for the better. I will be applying to nursing school after I complete my bachelor's degree in pre-medical studies and minor in psychology from Bay Path University in the spring of 2022. I want to thank my mom and my dad for pushing me to succeed every day and for O'Connell for this opportunity. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jennifer, and congratulations again. As you hear the stories of our healthcare heroes tonight, many of this put us in the front seat of that DeLorean and take us back to last February and March. That's when the world was changing, and not in a good way, obviously. A mysterious virus was making its way here to Western Massachusetts. No one could say when it would arrive or what would happen when it did. And when it did arrive, there was no small amount of chaos as hospitals and other care providers tried to prepare for the virus, take care of those who would contract it, and also take care of those who would be treating those individuals. Many jobs would change, but perhaps none more than that of the infection control officer. Which brings us to Maggie Iboso, whose title at Mercy Medical Center is Infection Control and Prevention Coordinator. And each of those words is important. It was and is her job to try to control and prevent the spread of this virus. It was and is her job to make sense of all the constantly changing roles and guidance on this pandemic and, in three simple words, keep people safe. It's a daunting task that has her taking on all kinds of responsibilities, from coaching staff on the proper use of PPE to navigating the hospital through all those changing guidelines, from advocating for advocate supp adequate supplies of PPE and making sure everyone is a good steward of those precious commodities, to simply providing a very much needed sense of calm amid a crisis unlike anything we've seen in this region. Maggie has done all those things, and perhaps most important, she has become that calm voice, that steady hand in the middle of this pandemic. Indeed, at a time when there's been so much information and so much different disinformation available to all of us, Maggie has been able to help the staff at Mercy and others in the community, such as those at the Hamden County Correctional Facility in Ludlow, separate fact from conjecture or assumption as they go about treating people and trying to keep all those around them safe. Today, she's waging a battle on many fronts, including one against what is emerging as a very strong foe, complacency. Indeed, as the pandemic wears on, she told me, people are getting tired. They're letting their guard down. They're thinking about the day when they can go back to normal and they want it to be here already. And who can blame them? Maggie doesn't, but she quickly reminds them that, if, that we're not back to normal yet, and if we're not careful, if we don't remain diligent, normal will become an even more elusive target. All of this is hard work, and she's not shying away from any of it. And this explains why she is a true healthcare hero. Ladies and gentlemen, Maggie Abosa. Good evening, my name is Manuel Iboso, Infection Prevention Coordinator at Mercy Medical Center. I would like to take this opportunity as I accept this award for Healthcare Hero 2020 to thank a number of people. First and foremost, all glory and honor goes to God for making this possible. 16 years ago when my journey in healthcare began here at Mercy Medical Center, if you had told me I would be a recipient of one such award, I would have said no way. This has truly been a humbling and honoring experience. I work with a phenomenal group of people who wholeheartedly support me in all my endeavors here at Mercy Medical Center. My president, Debbie Bitsoli, my CNO, my CMO, my director, and certainly the entire Mercy Medical family have all been a support that has enabled me to be where I am today. I certainly wouldn't be able to do this if I didn't have the unwavering support of my husband, my children, and family as a whole. And this year has certainly highlighted some of the unconventional aspects of all we do in healthcare. I'm accepting this truly on behalf of all those on the front lines fighting this pandemic. 
it is certainly not lost on me that I get to do what I love and receive recognition and accolades in the process. There are many unsung heroes that I would like to acknowledge as we continue to battle this pandemic. To all the dietary aids, to all the environmental services crew, to all the respiratory therapists, all the supply chain folks, all the transport, all the teachers, the chaplains, truly thank you. When 2020 began and was designated the year of the nurse, few of us would have imagined the demands that would have been placed on nursing. And boy, have the nurses outperformed those expectations. In conclusion, as this year draws to a close, I would like to take this moment to implore everyone to continue exercising all the mitigating mitigation practices that we've learned early at the beginning of this pandemic. Please continue to wear a mask, any type of face protection, outside, when outside the confines of our homes, avoid less social gatherings, continue to social distance, wash hands, wash them often, and truly controlling and preventing the spread of this virus is a collective responsibility for all of us. Thank you. Okay, thank you Maggie, and congratulations again. As we introduce our next honoree, I think I'll put in a not so shameless plug for my podcast. Okay, it's not my podcast, it's Business West and the Healthcare News podcast, called Business Talk, I'm just the host. It's not exactly my day job, but I'm uh, getting a handle on it, I guess, maybe, I don't really know. What I do know is I've been doing that this since May or so, and the guest that's drawn the most listeners by far has been Dr. Mark Kerouac, the president and CEO of Bay State Health. And there's a reason for that, actually quite a few of them. Mostly though, and obviously, it's because people want to hear what he has to say. In a time of crisis, people look for information. They look for direction. They look for a calm, steady voice. And above all else, they look for true leadership. And Dr. Mark Kerouac has provided all that, and he continues to provide it at a time when the region needs it most. In many respects, Mark has become our region's Dr. Anthony Fauci, at least from the standpoint that he has become a trusted, respected voice on this matter. He hasn't thrown out the first pitch in any pro baseball games that I know of, and he hasn't appeared on 60 Minutes, and he hasn't had FaceTime on all the major networks. But he has been, as that podcast showed, the go-to, sought-after source for information and guidance on this pandemic. In every way, Mark has been front and center during this pandemic. He was one of two people from Western Mass appointed by Governor Charlie Baker to the state's reopening advisory board. He has participated in Springfield Mayor Dominic Sarno's weekly COVID-19 press briefing. He has convened calls with area mayors, legislative, legislative leaders, and other hospital administrators in an effort to keep the pipeline of information open and help the region not only anticipate what comes next, but prepare for it. Above all else, and as I said, he has provided real leadership to the region as it has grappled with this crisis, and has been determined to make this not merely something to be survived, but something to learn from, something to make us better and stronger, tomorrow and decades from tomorrow. Every time a pandemic hits society, people who live through it are changed forever, he told Business West and the Healthcare News when he was interviewed. That's true of every pandemic throughout history. We'll look at the world differently in terms of health care as a right, or child care, and sick leave. We'll look at these issues very differently than we would have just a few years ago. At least, I hope we will. Insight Like That explains why he's not just a great podcast guest, but why he's become perhaps this region's most trusted voice during this pandemic, and also why he's a true health care hero. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mark Kerouac. I want to thank George, Kate, Business West, and Healthcare News for this prestigious award. In past years, I was pleased to present this award to others and applaud their heroic accomplishments. Frankly, I never thought of myself as qualified to be a recipient because I was no longer on the front lines. Long ago, I was on the front lines for another deadly pandemic, HIV and AIDS. My experiences 
helped me to sympathize with what I saw in the eyes of frontline caregivers during COVID. The fears of the unknown, the frustrations of not having clear cures or even clear approaches to care for patients. The awareness that this virus had mercilessly exposed everything that was wrong with our health system and our country. I know that my response to the HIV pandemic changed me as a person, as I believe this one will change all of us too, likely for the better. I believe it will make us more aware of the importance of being a community. Being a leader after you've been on the front lines yourself takes some getting used to. You're no longer the person at the bedside exposed to the risks and the rewards of caring for the patient. Your actions don't directly impact care or the well-being of the care team. You're more of a far-off coach than a player. And in a strange way, you come to embody the organization you lead in good times and in bad. You come to symbolize all the real heroes sweating beneath layers of PPE, worried that a sniffle might mean a serious illness for yourself or your family, exhausted by hours of wrangling with suppliers, uncertain if some new process or structure will really work, worried that your job might go away or that your kids might lose ground in their education or that your parents might not survive. Of course, no leader can embody all that. No one person can contain all the stories, all the courage, all the commitment of the real heroes in the COVID story. As a leader, what you do instead is everything you can to make sure the real heroes are safe and effective, that they have the equipment and knowledge to do their jobs, that they have the right frontline leaders to lead them, that they're organized to work as a team, and that they're aware of the heroes around them so they don't feel alone. You also do everything you can to tell their stories to anyone who will listen so that the world outside can know and appreciate them. That's all I've done these past several months. And that's why if anyone asks me if I'm a healthcare hero, I'll say maybe once long ago. For now, I'm proud to say I worked as a helper of heroes, thousands of them during the COVID pandemic. And it's on behalf of them that I accept this singular honor. Thank you again, Dr. Kerouac, and congratulations. As we move on to our next honoree, we can see that a trend is certainly emerging. It's one that we've seen across our region, in every industry and in every sector, in every individual business as well. That trend involves the need to pivot, that's the word, we've all heard it a million times, and do things differently, because we can't do, the way things, do things the way we always did them in the middle of a pandemic. And perhaps nowhere is that more true than in the world of home care. That's because the simple notion of going into someone's home has been absolutely turned on its head. Just going into someone's home has become a complicated and, yes, dangerous undertaking. But for many people, having someone come into their home and provide essential services is not an option. Which brings us to Helen Gobiel. She's the staffing supervisor of Visiting Angels in West Springfield. There's a lot that goes into her job description as staffing supervisor. A partial list includes recruiting new caregivers, consulting with prospective new clients, creating those all-important matches between clients and caregivers, scheduling care, meeting new and different needs as they emerge. And Helen had all of that down, every bit of it. And then COVID hit, and it changed everything, as in everything. There had to be new policies and new procedures, all created with the goal of keeping people safe. In this situation, Helen did what true leaders do. She stayed calm and made it her mission to keep everyone else calm. She addressed the many challenges directly and the overarching goal of addressing the many needs of all those involved, those receiving care in their homes, their family members, and those providing the care. Michelle Anstead, President and CEO of Visiting Angels, summed it all up perfectly when she wrote this in her nomination of Helen. Not only has she handled this crisis with extraordinary competence and resilience, she has remained a positive force in the lives of clients, their families, and caregivers. COVID-19 has not only presented physical challenges, but also mental ones, including severe anxiety and depression, and exacerbating loneliness, isolation, and sleep problems 
particularly to the senior population, she went on. To this end, Helen has not only served to protect the health of seniors across western Massachusetts, but she's also given peace of mind to families, seniors, and caregivers. I don't think I could have said that any better. Ladies and gentlemen, Helen Gobeal. to everyone for all this recognition. I am honored and grateful to my staff and all the families that trust visiting angels. Okay, thank you, Helen, and congratulations again on being a healthcare hero. We've been flashing back to last spring a lot tonight and something tells me we're not done yet. As you no doubt recall, that's when the governor put in place a stay-at-home order and shut down all non-essential businesses in hopes of flattening a curve, a phrase we're all hearing again, unfortunately. With some very rare exceptions, that order didn't apply to health care. The vital work being done simply had to go on. Such was the case at Friends of the Homeless in Springfield, a program of clinical and support options. While it's been anything but business as usual for this critical organization, that business kept getting done at a time when its services were more needed than ever. Indeed, Friends of the Homeless provides much more than shelter. It also provides clinical services such as mental health and substance abuse counseling, prescription pickups, and case management. That work had to go on, and it has. But the way it went about that work did have to change, and the team at Friends of the Homeless provides a textbook case of a group of dedicated people working together to solve problems and meet needs that actually grew during the summer and fall months as the pandemic took its toll on the economy. As you probably read and heard, homeless populations have been among those hardest hit by the pandemic. In many cities, including Boston, Worcester, and others, the number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths within the homeless populations were alarmingly high. I'll knock on some wood now, right here at this podium, but this hasn't happened in Springfield, and this is owed in large part to the team at Friends of the Homeless and their ability to work through the problem and find ways to keep on doing what they do, but keep people safe while doing so. Changes included picnic tables and tents erected outdoors to accommodate distance meal lines, temperature screenings and interviews with clients to alert staff members to potential problems, expansive use of testing, and the use of large tent facilities that served as emergency accommodations in the event of positive cases, just to name a few. Bill Miller, Vice President of Housing and Homeless Services for Friends of the Homeless, summed things up perfectly when he told Business West and the Healthcare News, people have to gather here, so we're potentially a hot spot. All the credit goes to the people who kept it from becoming that. There wasn't one person who backed out who wasn't going to show up for work. We have a dedicated team who have been here a long time. It was incredible how everyone showed up. Well, they didn't just show up. They showed up with compassion. They showed up with ideas on how things could be done differently and safely. They showed up with a determination not to let Springfield and its homeless facilities become a hotspot. Like I said, they didn't just show up. They collectively became healthcare heroes. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Miller. I must say that for some of you thinking about shelter providers as healthcare heroes might, be, might seem a bit odd. I think uh, I have two things to say about that. You know, in this pandemic, in some ways, we're all healthcare heroes. We're all having to face up and do things that we're not used to. But in a shelter situation, it's a little bit different. On any given night, we've got about 250 people living in residence on our, on our campus on Worthington Street. We have both shelter and housing. We have a, a dining room where we serve uh, people meals three times a day. So we're open 24 seven and we have between 60 and 70 staff people rotating in during the week. So if you think about the numbers of people that are there and the potential uh, what we've all been told to do, which is depopulate, stay home, uh, you know, uh, quarantine if you can, uh, that sort of runs counter to our mission. Our, we've always taken pride in 
serving as many people as we possibly can, especially in the winter months and, um, and COVID protocols just run counter to that part of the mission. So, so, so what, what did we do? What are we doing? You know, we had to um, almost immediately start to blend in the first protocols that, were, that we began to learn about early on, and that was mask wearing, it was sanitizing, and it was social distancing to the degree that we could. And I think that we've done an excellent job. I have to say this award is a team award and it's going out to our staff who uh, from the get-go, uh, nobody blinked. Um, our team, many of our team members have been around for an awfully long time and, um, and they just uh, have stayed true to the mission uh, throughout. We've been at work uh, since March and up to today and we'll be there tomorrow and, uh, and even tonight. And so I just want to really shout out to our team members who are the true awardees for this. Um, thank you for the work that you've been doing. Um, you've saved people's lives. Um, and, and so we're so pleased to, to receive this award. We do want to thank our community partners, City of Springfield, the police department, uh, certainly Bay State and Mercy Hospital have been terrific partners in all of this. And I also want to add that without CSO as a as a partner, now a merged partner, uh, we never would have been able to do this. There's uh, so much business that goes behind the scenes in running a shelter, uh, things that uh, you as business leaders understand, HR and IT and uh, facilities and so many things. And so having all those team members has made a huge difference. But at the end of the day, it's, the, it's our team uh, who are boots on the ground, very diverse team, people with comorbidities, if you will, forgive me for sort of describing it in medical terms. You know, we have um, uh, people who have just dedicated themselves to the mission um, and, uh, and we've been able to show up and serve people. We typically serve a thousand people a year over the course of the year. Uh, I don't know our exact numbers now, but um, I guarantee 150 people are having dinner at FOH tonight and, and will be tomorrow and we're going to keep keep conducting our business in a safe way and we're looking forward to the vaccine and and again we thank you Business West for this award and we look forward to seeing you all in person soon. Okay, thank you, Bill, and the entire team at Friends of the Homeless. As I introduce our next honoree, let me start by saying that you heard me use the phrase front lines quite a few times tonight, and I'm probably not done using it. When people think of that phrase front lines with respect to health care and this pandemic, they think of hospitals, emergency rooms, and nursing homes. And as we've learned today, that phrase also applies to home care facilities, homeless shelters, and much more. But in this war against a killer virus, there are many, many fronts, and thus many, many front lines. This pandemic has introduced us to yet another front, the one involving research, testing, innovation, and new product development. Which brings us to the Institute for Applied Life Sciences at UMass Amherst, which has been able to step up during this pandemic and make some potentially game-changing contributions. The Institute was created in 2013 with the goal of accelerating life science research and advancing collaboration with industry to shorten the gap between scientific innovation and technological advancement. And during the pandemic, it has done just that with some remarkable results that include the development of a low-cost face shield for rapid production, work to demonstrate that hydrogen peroxide sterilization for N95 respirators does, in fact, work, a vital development in coping what was, what was then a critical shortage of masks. Fabrication of a longer cable for ventilators, which provides added safety to care providers using them. Local production of viral transport media, VTM, used to keep COVID-19 samples safe during transport, thus meeting a critical need at local hospitals. And most recently, as a testing site. We didn't want to be sitting at home watching this pandemic unfold without doing something, Peter Reinhardt, director of the Institute for Applied Life Sciences, told Business West and the Healthcare News. 
and it has done anything but sit at home. Instead, it has become a problem-solving resource for this entire region, the country, and the world. And in many respects, and a model for how institutes like this one can work in collaboration with others to innovate and create imaginative answers to hard questions. The difference between UMass and every other organization I've worked at in both industry and academia is the spirit of collaboration, Reinhardt told us. We've been at organizations where it's very hard to get collaborations working across departmental boundaries. It's much more contained, focus on individual greatness as opposed to collective greatness. That's the difference I see at UMass Amherst. People across organizational boundaries will jump in and help you. Over the past nine months, these collaborative efforts have produced a number of success stories with the promise of many more to come. And they have made the Institute for Applied Life Sciences a healthcare hero for 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Reinhardt. I'm delighted to accept this Healthcare Heroes Award on behalf of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. The work giving rise to this award came out of a desire, a desire felt by faculty, staff, and students, a desire to do something, to make a difference during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Institute for Applied Life Science acted as an organizing force, but the many individuals that contributed their time and energy to address regional unmet needs are the actual healthcare heroes. We had whole teams of people producing viral transport media needed for COVID-19 testing when none was available. The medium was produced well over 100,000 doses and distributed to many different regional testing centers that were unable to perform testing during those early days of the pandemic. Other teams created face shields that could be produced and shipped flat we produced over 100,000 of these, distributed them to many different healthcare centers, all for free. Other engineering teams produced respirator parts that would allow frontline healthcare workers to monitor patients remotely during those days when PPE was still difficult to obtain. Most recently, the campus has created a clinical testing center that is able to perform COVID-19 testing both for on-campus and off-campus residents of Western Massachusetts. I should emphasize this testing is made available for free via this testing site. These are just a few examples of the many COVID-19 related activities going on on this campus. And this award serves to recognize all of the individuals that contributed to making a difference during this COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, thank you again to Peter and the entire team at the Institute for Applied Life Sciences at UMass Amherst. As Kate and I have mentioned, in a year like this one, our healthcare heroes work in many different settings, handling many different types of missions. Which brings us to the nutrition department at Greater Springfield Senior Services. This dedicated core of professionals already had a challenging assignment to carry out, bringing home delivered meals, or HDMs, I learned a new acronym, always love learning new acronyms, to thousands of seniors across this region. Needless to say, this assignment became exponentially more difficult when COVID-19 arrived in Western Massachusetts. Indeed, every aspect of providing those HDMs became more challenging, from securing new caterers to cook them, to hiring more drivers to delivering them, to creating new policies for delivering meals with the least amount of contact from the drivers. It was like starting over and creating a whole new way of doing things. Which brings us back to that team. Uh, there's roughly 10 of them at Greater Springfield Senior Services. While the rest of the 250 so employees at this agency packed up just before St. Patrick's Day and went to work remotely, this crew stayed on at the facility on Industrial Drive in Springfield and developed a strategy for meeting this crisis head on. Jill Keough, Executive Director of Greater Springfield Senior Services, summed up the mindset succinctly and perfectly when she told me, we knew we couldn't leave people behind. And they didn't. Like I said, they developed new ways of doing things, like grab-and-go meals, single-use plastic bags to keep their drivers and seniors from receiving the meals safe. Tracy Landry, 
one of the HMD supervisors, spoke for everyone when she said, we had more meetings than you can imagine when we first started with this. Every day was different, and every day there was a new challenge. Actually, with that, she spoke for all 10 of our healthcare heroes. Each day has been different. Each day has seemingly brought a new challenge. And each day, these heroes have found the energy, the imagination, and the sheer will to meet those challenges. The pandemic has seemingly brought out the best in all of us, and has certainly brought out the best in these 10, the nutrition department at Greater Springfield Senior Services. Ladies and gentlemen, Jill Keough. On behalf of everyone here at Greater Springfield Senior Services, I say thank you for selecting us as a healthcare hero. We're truly humbled by this recognition, and I am really proud of our team and the way we responded to a 37% increase in home delivered meals during the height of the pandemic. I'm also really proud of the way we responded to the need created by the closure of the adult day health programs, as well as the congregate dining sites. All of this would not have been possible without the generosity of the Community Foundation. It's with their financial support we were able to expand this program during the height of the pandemic. We were able to serve folks we've never served before, and we're really proud of that accomplishment, and we can't wait to continue to serve those folks. I'd also like to thank the PVTA for their support in providing transportation to these sites at no cost to Greater Springfield. Once again, that helped make this program sustainable and allowed us to continue to expand it. I'd also like to recognize Mary Genuine Kaplan, who is no longer with Greater Springfield, but forever in our hearts for the contributions that she made uh, through her tremendous leadership during this crisis. I could not have done it without her, and I'm truly appreciative of all that she gave um, to the nutrition program, as well as Greater Springfield throughout her tenure. I'd also like to thank and recognize those who are also being honored tonight. We're very proud to be part of such an esteemed group and thank you to all who selected us and thought of us for this recognition. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jill, and to all those at Greater Springfield Senior Services. Anyone who knows me even a little knows I'm a mil military historian of a sort. I've read hundreds of books on the subject, most of them focused on the World War II generation. So I have a genu genuine respect and admiration for veterans of all wars, and like everyone else, I was deeply impacted by what happened at the Holyoke Soldiers' Home last spring. This was a tragedy on many levels, and it's now a national and even international story. There's hardly anything good about what happened at the Soldiers' Home, except except the truly remarkable way in which the staff at Holyoke Medical Center came together as a unit, as a team, as a small army, as CEO Carl Cameron described it to me, and gave many of these veterans a new home. While it might sound easy to move 40 veterans a few blocks, that's really all it was in this case, that's not the case at all. Holyoke Medical Center is an acute care hospital. A soldier's home is a long-term care facility. Converting one into the other is immensely difficult under any circumstances, and this job had to be done quickly and under extreme duress. The staff at HMC did all that. They got the veterans' rooms. They got them TVs. They stocked the fridge with their favorite beers. They took care of them. Beyond that, though, they made them feel at home. They provided safety and comfort, and at a time when it was desperately needed. And what you can't forget is that those at HMC were doing all this as they were trying to get a handle on COVID-19 and handle a surge in cases themselves. It was a time for an entire hospital to come together, a time for people to toss aside whatever was in their job description and say, what can I do? How can I help? What can I do to make life a little easier for these men and women who served our country so bravely? Spera Soteras, President and CEO of Holyoke Medical Center, spoke for everyone when he told Business West and the Healthcare News Everyone put their roles aside and said, all hands on deck. Likewise, Angelo Martinez, a member of plant operations team, put things in perspective when he said of that first hectic day, at the end of the day, I was tired, but it was a good feeling 
because these veterans did a lot for us and we owe them for all they've done. And finally, there was this from Jeff Ferris, one of the furloughed physical therapists who returned to take on a new role as a veterans liaison. My father was a veteran. He spent 20 years in the Air Force. My brother spent four, and I'm also a veteran. I was in the National Guard in the Air Reserves. So this was a perfect transition for me. I was happy to come back and help out. It's been an honor to serve these people. Just as our first honorees, those from Berkshire Healthcare Systems, set the tone for today, I think those from Holyoke Medical Center put a nice cap on things. Their actions and their sentiments speak for all those honorees who came before them. And here to say a few words on behalf of his team is Sparris Kateris. Sparris? The men and women that we helped, uh, that drove the nomination for this award, uh, gave many, you know, good years of their of their lives to preserving freedom for us and fighting for freedom. And um, I think this is the least that we could have done uh, to help them and, and in some small way, uh, hopefully pay back, uh, you know, the the great sacrifice that they made for us. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate our entire team for earning this award for Healthcare Heroes. Thank you from the Soldiers Home Unit, from the Case Management Team, from Plant Operations, from the Emergency Department, from General Surgery, from Speech and Hearing, from Med Surge, from the Caregiver Services and Community Outreach, from Physical Therapy, from GI, from the Pulmonary and Thoracic Department, from IMC, from Pain Management, from the Women's Center, from Imaging Services, from the lab, from environmental services, from security department, from weight management, from behavioral health, from the center for learning, from periop services, from the quality division, from ICU. Okay, thank you to spare us and to all those at Holyoke Medical Center for that truly inspiring message. Well, I guess that wraps things up for today's program. I said at the top that these stories were inspirational and in many ways remarkable, and I'm sure you found them to be that and much, much more. All those who were nominated this year are true heroes, and there are many more now working here in Western Massachusetts. Soon it will be time to nominate groups and individuals to be members of the Healthcare Heroes class of 2021. We hope you will nominate someone and that someday those people can be honored the way we've honored our people here tonight. With that, on behalf of everyone who calls this region home, I would like to give a final thank you to all our healthcare heroes. You make us all extremely proud. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for joining us.